Oh, uh, thank you all for coming out again. And thank you uh, for coming out for a second week to those who were here last week. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Catherine Dale and I am the coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, and here with us tonight, we also have Jenna McDermott, who is our assistant coordinator, and she's going to be monitoring the chat for us. Uh, and we're lucky enough to also have one of our expert Newfoundland birders, Megan Boucher. And Megan is going to be keeping an eye on the chat for us as well. And luckily for all of us, Megan is going to offer us some advice on turns uh, because Megan is an expert on turns. So when we get to that section, I'm going to be handing it off to Megan. Um, so Jenna and I both work for Birds Canada, and I know this is a little bit of a repeat for some of you guys because you were here last week, but for those of you who aren't familiar with Birds Canada, uh, we are the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. Our tagline is that we are Canada's voice for birds, and our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of wild birds and their habitats. And we do that uh, across the country, largely through a pretty wide variety of programs. One of the things that I think is really neat about Birds Canada is that a lot of our programs are citizen science based, by which I mean they depend on the participation of volunteers. And uh, each year we engage more than three, more than 30,000 volunteers across Canada, which I think is pretty amazing when you think about it. We're relative newcomers to Newfoundland. Um, so many of you know that uh, we started, we launched the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas in 2020. So I moved to Newfoundland in 2019 to get that underway. And then Jenna joined us in 2020. Um, and what the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas is, is it's a huge science, uh, citizen science effort basically. So it's a five-year project. And our aim is to map the distribution and the abundance of all the species of birds that breed in Newfoundland. Uh, so we're producing maps like that one you can see there. That's a map for the ruby crown kinglet, which you can see in the photo. And each of those squares represents a place where a birder has reported a sighting of a breeding ruby crowned kinglet. Um, and so that's obviously a map in progress. You can see there's a big hole in the south central part of the island, uh, but we're working to map out everywhere that all of these species breed on the island. And then we do have one additional uh, project in Newfoundland. Uh, so we participate in the Atlantic Canada Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, and what this is, so it's a much shorter survey. It's six weeks every spring. It's an ongoing survey. And for one night during those six weeks, uh, volunteers go out and survey a route of 10 stops for owls. Uh, so the survey season runs from the 1st of April to the 15th of May, and we are just starting to get that underway for this year, and we're looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering for either of these programs, you can check out our website, the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas website, or you can email us at nlatlas at birdscanada.org. And that will be on the last slide, so uh, I, you, no worries if you didn't write it down. Um, so we would also like to take just a moment at the beginning of this presentation to thank all of our partners, supporters, and funders. Uh, the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas is obviously a huge project, and it's certainly not something that we could pull off on our own. Uh, so we have partnered with a number of other organizations, provincial, federal government, other NGOs, and industry to make this happen. And uh, without their support, things like this webinar series would not be possible. Okay, so now on to seabirds. So this is kind of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to start by considering what exactly is a seabird, talk a little bit about Newfoundland and seabirds, and then we're going to cover families of seabirds that have at least one representative that occurs regularly in uh, Newfoundland. And we are focusing specifically on Newfoundland. Okay, so what is a seabird? Well, if you look in your field guide, you're not going to find a section dedicated to seabirds. It's not really a formal definition. And uh, as it turns out, there isn't actually any agreement on exactly which families belong in this particular group. Uh, so I liked this quote from two seabird biologists who said the one common characteristic that all seabirds share is that they feed in salt water, except those that don't. And that is, as they say, very common in biology. Uh, it can make things very confusing. I remember writing a blog post once where I spent about three hours trying to figure out if people thought terns were seabirds or not. Uh, so it isn't a clear cut definition, but there are things that seabirds do seem to have in common. 
So these are birds that make their living primarily from the ocean. Most of them have dense waterproof feathers and layers of fat and a desalination system. So if they drink seawater, they need to have a way to get rid of that excess salt. Uh, most of them have webbed feet, which helps in swimming. And they tend to be long lived, by which I mean 30 years or more, and have what we call delayed breeding. So our little perching songbirds, they will hatch one summer and then the next summer they'll be, they'll be right into breeding. With seabirds, you're often looking at individuals waiting five to 10 years before they start breeding. And the theory is this actually may be an evolutionary adaptation for life in a very variable ocean environment, because it gives them several years to figure out how to forage uh, in different seasons. So how to make sure that they're always finding enough food and their long life gives them a lot of chances to try to successfully reproduce, which can be very challenging. So I really didn't know that much about seabirds until I moved here to Newfoundland. And uh, I, it's been a very steep learning curve since then. So many of you will know that Newfoundland is considered the seabird capital of North America. Uh, so this island has 29,000 kilometers of coastline and it provides habitat for more than 35 million seabirds. So something else that a lot of seabirds have in common is they tend to breed in colonies. And so when you see breeding seabirds, you're seeing them in huge numbers. Uh, Newfoundland boasts the largest colony of leeches storm petrels in the world. Uh, so we had that colony has more than 3 million breeding pairs and the largest colony of Atlantic puffins in North America, uh, which is more than 300,000 pairs. This picture here, uh, many of you may recognize that, that was taken at Cape St. Mary's, which is, which is on the Avalon Peninsula. It's one of my absolute favorite places in Newfoundland. It's an amazing, amazing place for seabirds. And it's one of a whole network of uh, wilderness and ecological reserves. Um, so this map here shows you those reserves and the ones that are in blue are seabird ecological reserves. Uh, so that includes Cape St. Mary's down here, which I've told you about. It also includes Bakaloo Island, which is the big colony of leeches storm petrels, Whitless Bay, which is the big colony of puffins, uh, Hare Bay Islands, Funk Islands, um, and this picture here was actually taken on Funk Island, uh, which is one of the most amazing seabird colonies we have, a little bit harder to get to than Cape St. Mary's. Uh, and for those of you who have never been near a seabird colony, it's difficult to describe the level of noise and the cacophony that's happening there and the smell. The smell is quite unique. Uh, so the best I can say is visit Cape St. Mary's if you haven't. So the seabird families that we're going to cover today. Um, we're not gonna talk about every single seabird that has ever been seen in Newfoundland because that would be incredibly overwhelming. And to be honest, I found this list a little bit overwhelming already. Uh, so what we're focusing on here is those that actually breed here with a couple of exceptions and those exceptions are in light gray on the list. Um, part of the reason for that is seabirds, as I said, make their living from the ocean and so they're actually, you're not likely to see them unless they're breeding because they only come to land to breed most of the time. So that's why we're focusing on these, uh, these breeding seabirds. Um, you'll notice there are no gulls and terns on this list, even though I can tell you as a result of my many hours of searching that indeed most people do consider terns seabirds. Um, those are actually on a slide further along. So once we finish with these classic seabirds, we'll move on to the gulls and terns. Um, a couple other notes, so, as I said, it's been a steep learning curve since I moved to Newfoundland. So I'm gonna share what I've managed to learn, but I know that we are lucky enough to have a couple of really expert birders here with us tonight. So we have Megan Boucher and we also have Vernon Buckle. Um, and so if I've forgotten anything or you guys want to add anything to my identification cues, then please jump right in there because the more knowledge, the better. Okay, so we're gonna start with the Northern Fulmer. And the first time I saw a picture of this guy, I thought, oh, that's a gull. So it does look quite a bit like a gull, but it's, it's a little bit stockier than a gull. And one of the things I want to point out is it belongs to the tube nose family or the Procellariforms. And those guys, I mean, they're not too creative in naming a lot of the time. So they're so named because they have their nostrils enclosed in this little tube. And most of them tend to have then a straight bill with a little bit of a hooked tip, which you can't see super well in this photo. Um, 
So this tube nose actually contributes to a highly developed sense of smell in procellariforms. Um, it allows them to find prey on the ocean surface. And then that hooked bill allows them to hold on to slippery food like fish and squid. Uh, they drink seawater like, like other seabirds, and they excrete salt through this nasal gland that they have at the base of their bill. So basically that uh, takes the salt out of their bloodstream and uh, concentrates it into a saltwater solution, which then drips out of the tube nose. So ID cues for the northern fulmar. Um, it does, as I said, look a bit like a gull, uh, but it's got a much thicker neck and it's generally a bulkier bird. And it has uh, stiffer, straighter wings than, than gulls do. Um, so, and one of the things I thought was actually stuck with me about this, I was uh, reading in a bird book and it said that fulmers fly like tanks with stiff wing beats. So I, I mean, to me, flying and tanks don't exactly go hand in hand, but I think I get what they're getting at. Um, gulls have much looser, slower wing beats, but fulmers have these stiff, straight wings and these thick necks. Um, they have the tube nose, which gulls lack. They have, you can see here, a dark smudge around the eye, short tail, and then this short, thick, yellowish bill. Of course, just to make matters complicated, Northern fulmers actually do come in multiple color morphs. So they, they kind of fall along a color gradient from the light morph, which is the guy I just showed you there, to a dark morph, which is much grayer. Um, sometimes I think birds are really just out to confuse us. However, you can see many of the same attributes on this bird. This isn't the easiest shot, but you can see that short bill, yellow, you can see the tube nose again and the dark smudge by the eye. And then that thick neck. So I thought it was interesting to know that uh, fulmers are opportunistic feeders and they're often seen um, scavenging discards from fishing boats. And so we've actually seen a pretty big range expansion in northern fulmers. This um, range map shows the current range and the pink is the breeding, the purple is uh, the year round range and then the blue is winter. And so you can see that they breed in Newfoundland here but actually the first, they were first recorded in Newfoundland in the 1960s, so relatively recently, and now they're common year round. Um, they breed on steep ocean cliffs in colonies, uh, places like Cape St. Mary's, Whitless Bay, the Funk Islands. Um, but uh, it, it's thought that some of their range expansion might have something to do with the growth of commercial fisheries because they do feed on the discards from fishing boats. Um, and I should note here that their distribution is actually worldwide, but this just shows the North American distribution. Okay, so that is the Northern Fulmer. Moving on to another tube nose in the petrel family. This is Leech's storm petrel. And uh, you can see here, much smaller bird, but you can see that characteristic tube nose there. So it's like the petrels are the smallest procellariforms. And leeches storm petrels are probably the most common seabird that you've never heard of or seen. Uh, they're one of the most abundant seabirds in Eastern Canada, but they spend their lives out at sea, except for breeding. And when they breed, you still don't see them very much because they breed in burrows. So they nest in burrows and they only come to and from those burrows in the dark. So they spend the day out at sea and then they come back to the burrow at night uh, to avoid predators. They're about the size of a robin, um, making them the smallest member, as I said, of the tube nose family. And I think it's really cool that they weigh under 50 grams. And yet these guys will travel as much as 1200 kilometers offshore to forage during the breeding season. So that's a pretty substantial journey when you weigh less than 50 grams. ID cues for leeches storm petrel, which is the only storm petrel that breeds in Newfoundland. Uh, we've got long angled arched wings. We've got this pale bar on the wing called a carpal bar that reaches all the way to the leading edge of the wing. Of course, we've got the little tube nose that we talked about. We've got a long tail, relatively speaking, with a deep notch. So you can see that that tail is relatively forked. And then we've got short legs. You can't really see in this picture, there, there is a little bit of a hint of a leg there, but you'll have to trust me, they're there. And that's important to note because the only other storm petrel you might see around here is Wilson's storm petrel. And I apologize, this isn't a great photo. Um, I had to source a couple of them off the internet. Storm petrels, as I said, a lot of people don't see them. So we didn't have a ton of photos of them lying around. 
Um, but you can see the differences on this photo of the, the Wilson storm petrel. So first of all, you can see that that carpal bar doesn't go quite all the way to the top. But I think what's easier is instead of a forked tail, you've got a flat tail like that. Um, it's, a, it's a straight tail. And you'll see that the legs actually extend beyond the end of the tail on the Wilson storm petrel. Uh, so those are cues you can use to distinguish the two species of storm petrels, which look relatively alike, uh, but you probably don't need to worry about it. And that is because Wilson storm petrels breed in Antarctica, not here, and they're rarely seen uh, on land once they travel away from their breeding grounds. So if you're on land in Newfoundland and you see a storm petrel, it's probably a leech's storm petrel. You probably don't need to worry too much about Wilson storm petrels unless you're actually out on the ocean. And I wanted to highlight something briefly about storm petrels uh, because I did mention, I think several times now, that it's that Newfoundland is home to the largest breeding colony of leeches storm petrels in the world on Bakaloo Island, which you can see just up on the top of the Avalon Peninsula there. Um, and in fact, it, colonies in Newfoundland may actually be home to as much as 50% of the global population of leeches storm petrels, which gives us a pretty huge responsibility, I'd say, for them. Um, so in 1985, the colony on Bakalu Island uh, was estimated to be about 6.6 .6 million birds. And then there were another 1.4 million petrels in nearby colonies in Rubus Bay and, and, that, and the area. But when these same colonies were surveyed 20 to 30 years later, what it looks like is they've experienced a 40 to 50% population decline, which is incredible. If you think about it, that's 3.3 petrels that have, sorry, 3.3 million petrels that have disappeared from these colonies, which is really quite shocking. Um, and uh, we're really not sure exactly what is going on, um, but researchers have looked at survival during different periods of the storm petrels life cycle. And what they found is that chick survival, so survival from the chick hatching to when it fledges and leaves the island, is actually pretty high. It's close to 100%. But adult survival, so the survival of an adult from when it leaves the breeding colony to when it comes back the next year, is quite low for a seabird. So it's only about 80%. And that, that really is extremely low for a long-lived seabird. And so something is going on while these guys are away from the breeding colony, it looks like. Uh, and there are four hypotheses that people have investigated. Um, first, they wondered if it might be predation in burrows. Uh, but if that were the case, we'd probably see more of an effect on chick survival and not so much on adult survival. So that doesn't seem to necessarily be the problem. Um, another hypothesis was that there just isn't enough food. But again, if that were the case, we'd probably see an effect on chick survival. And we're not seeing that but we don't know for sure what's going on with their food resources once they're off the breeding grounds. Um, there's also the theory that pollution could be playing a role. Uh, so birds in colonies that are declining rapidly seem to have really high mercury levels, or at least higher than those in colonies that aren't uh, decreasing. And also a lot of plastic pellets have been found in uh, petrol stomachs. So there is possibility that pollution is playing a role. And then the last hypothesis is artificial light attraction. So anyone who's ever participated in uh, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society's Puffin and Petrel Patrol will know that uh, petrels are among those birds that are really attracted to artificial light. So they will come into coastal communities because of the light, and they're often attracted to offshore oil and gas platforms as well. And so there is some suspicion that they're foraging near these platforms and that's leading to fatal attraction to light. Uh, so those, those are the hypotheses for this massive decrease in petrels. Uh, we're still not exactly sure what's going on, but a lot of people are working on the problem, including a number of researchers at, Bird Can at Birds Canada. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that because I think it's, a, it's an interesting, if slightly overwhelming story about the storm petrels. And sorry, I forgot to put up this little graph here, which just shows a dramatic decrease in the population of uh, leeches storm petrels on Bakalu Island um, at about a uh, decrease of about 2.1% per year. Okay, moving on again to a, another totally different family from the smallest to the largest. 
Uh, we're moving on to the Northern Gannets. And I'm guessing that most of you who are in Newfoundland have probably seen a Northern Gannet. Certainly anybody who's been to Cape St. Mary's has. Uh, that's one of the major breeding species there. Um, and this is our largest breeding seabird in the, the North Atlantic. Um, so it's not too hard to recognize. I've picked out some ID features here. You've got that yellowish wash on the head. You've got a really big dagger-like bill. Um, white primary feathers, and then black wing tips. Actually, I think I've got that backward. Um, it's actually white secondary feathers. Anyway, white inner part of the wing and black wing tips. Um, so gannets travel long distances to forage, and they're a common sight all along the coasts of uh, Newfoundland. There are actually only six breeding colonies of gannets in North America. So three are in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Quebec and then three are along the coast of Newfoundland. And Cape St. Mary's is actually the southernmost breeding colony of gannets in the world. And it's also, as I've said, quite accessible. So it's the most accessible colony well worth a visit. Um, and I think one of the things that's really, really cool about gannets uh, is how they feed. So they perform these amazingly precise dives. You can see here a diving gannet looking a little bit like a torpedo, hitting the water at about 100 kilometers an hour. Um, and the precision is unbelievable. So they'll dive right beside each other and they don't seem to hit each other. Um, it's really quite a sight to see. I will tell you, if you're trying to take a photo of it, it can take a very long time. So I think I took about 150 photos to get this one photo where I caught the gannet at the right moment. Now I did say they're pretty easy to identify and this is true, but one thing to watch out for when you're identifying gannets is the immature gannets. So juvenile and immature gannets can be a little bit trickier because they're dark in color. And then they, they mature over a period of four to five years. So again, remember that delayed breeding that we often see in seabirds uh, becoming whiter as they go. So you see these immature gannets that are kind of a mix of brown and white. And uh, because we don't have a lot of you know, enormous brown seabirds, uh, you can misidentify them. And a few years ago, actually, there was a researcher at Cape St. Mary's who did see a brown booby, which is very unusual uh, for Newfoundland, but a lot of people wondered if by any chance he had made a mistake and confused a juvenile gannet for a brown booby. He hadn't, as it happens, uh, but keep that in mind that the juveniles are a lot darker. And speaking of large brownish seabirds, uh, we're moving on to double-crested cormorants, uh, which I think it would be fair to say is actually one of the most hated birds in the world, which seems very unfair. They have a little bit of a reputation issue. Uh, in Newfoundland and other places, they're also known as shags. Uh, so double-crested cormorants, some ID cues for them. Uh, you've got black, brownish black feathers. They can have a green or bronze sheen. A long tail, um, you've got this hooked bill, and then bright blue eyes, and then this orange at the base of the bill and the chin. Um, they've got these long snake-like necks, so their profile is actually pretty unmistakable um, if you keep an eye out for those necks. And this guy here is spreading his wings, and that's a common posture for them um, that they use to dry their feathers after swimming. And you might think, well, okay, aren't, aren't seabirds waterproof? Um, cormorants actually have less preen oil than some of the other seabirds, so their feathers get wet rather than shedding water like a duck's, um, which you might think doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a bird that spends most of its time underwater. But the theory is that these wet feathers might actually make it easier for cormorants to hunt underwater. Uh, regardless, when they get out, they need to dry them, so they often will stand there with their wings open. We do have one other species of cormorant that we get in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, and that is uh, the great cormorant. So it's very similar in shape to the double-crested cormorant. Uh, it's bigger, and you can probably see the main difference white, right away, um, and that is that white cheeks and throat. Uh, so that white patch on the face is different from the double-crested cormorant. And then the other difference you actually can't see here, um, but if you would if it was in flight, so it has white flank patches. So right under the wing here, you, you're gonna see some white patches. And uh, if we compare the two of them and we, we consider which one we're more likely to see, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I have for a long time wondered why the double-crested cormorant is called the double-crested cormorant 
well, here you go. Here are the crests. So they have, when they're breeding, they have these small tufts on the side of their heads, uh, but they're act it's actually relatively difficult to see them. Um, so that's an unusual photo. Um, if we look at where we're likely to see both of these species, you'll see that the great cormorant is not as widespread and not as common as the double crested cormorant, which is actually the only cormorant you'll likely see inland away from the coast. Okay, so now we are moving on to our ox. So these are birds of the family Alcidae, um, and this is the same family as the extinct great auk. Uh, so superficially, they look a little bit like penguins. Um, you've got black and white coloration, and you'll see auks are often standing upright like this, like we think of penguins. Um, but I should say one big difference is that all of the extant ox, uh, so with the exception of the extinct great auk, all ox do actually fly. Um, and obviously there are other differences from penguins. They don't, we don't think they're actually closely related. We think it's an example of convergent evolution. So uh, species facing similar challenges develop similar characteristics. So we're gonna start with the common myrrh. Uh, common myrrh is known as a tur in Newfoundland. And they nest in colonies on steep cliffs. So they're another common breeder at Cape St. Mary's, which is where this photo was taken. Um, and so you see this penguin-like coloration. You see the, the white breast and belly and then the black upper parts. They've got a relatively long, thin bill. They're standing upright. Uh, and then they've got a black, brown head, neck, back. And they've got this line of white tips on their secondary wing feathers, which you can just see there. And we do have two different species of MERS in Newfoundland. Uh, common MERS are the ones that people see a lot more often, I think. Uh, certainly they're easier to see at Cape St. Mary's, but we also have thick-billed MERS. And they look quite similar. Again, you've got the same coloration, the same upright posture. There are two big differences you can look at. One is this thin white line on the upper bill. Um, I try and remember that thick-billed mirrors look like they have a milk mustache. That's one of the things that stick in my, sticks in my head. And then the other is uh, that the white on the breast comes up to a point. And if you look back at the common mirrors, you'll see that the join is, is flat. So there isn't that sharp point where the white meets the black, which there is on the thick-billed mirror. So I said we have two species of mirrors here. So what exactly is this that we're looking at here? And this is something that it's actually really easy to be confused by. Does anyone wanna put in the chat what this guy is? Vernon and Megan, you guys are exempt. Anyone wanna guess what this guy is? Okay, so somebody said thinker, which uh, we're getting to. Um, wow, we've got all different kinds of guesses here. Common myrrh, uh, black guillemot, thick-billed myrrh, all kinds of things. So this is actually a common myrrh. Um, you can see there isn't that sharp point there. Uh, you don't have the line on the upper bill, but what you do have is this pattern around the eye. And this, as I said, can easily be quite confusing. Um, so that's what we call a bridled common myrrh. And basically in the Atlantic, not in the Pacific, but in the Atlantic, we have a situation where common myrrhs are what we call dimorphic. So there are two different plumage variations. You've got the unbridled version and the bridled version. And what's really interesting about this to me, um, so it seems to be really simple genetically. Bridling is uh, recessive and un being unbridled is dominant. So it's, it's like when you learned eye color in school, you know, brown eyes are dominant and blue eyes are recessive. Um, but bridling actually seems to associate, be associated with cold adaptation. So the frequency of bridled MERS in a population correlates with sea surface temperature. Um, so colder temperatures of breeding colonies means more bridled MERS. And when you look at their survival, um, survival increases with warmer temperatures for the unbridled birds, but it decreases with warmer temperatures for the bridled birds. Uh, so this, this plumage seems to be linked to cold adaptation in the birds, uh, which I find really interesting. And uh, when I was in grad school, one of my colleagues actually studied what the genetic basis of both the plumage 
variation and uh, the, the cold adaptation was and found some really neat stuff. So I always find that really, really interesting about MERS, uh, but it does, I need to keep reminding myself that the most obvious plumage difference is between those bridled and unbridled MERS, but they're actually the same species. And then the MERS where you really have to look for the difference are the ones that are the different species. Okay, so somebody mentioned tinkers or thinkers in the chat. Uh, they're talking about razor bills. So these are one of my absolute favorite Newfoundland seabirds. Um, you can see quite clearly that it's an auk. We've got the black and white color scheme. We've got the upright posture. Um, they're called tinkers apparently because during their during courtship, they hold their bill up vertically and it looks like they're contemplating the heavens. Uh, and so they got called thinkers or in local pronunciation tinkers, which I thought was really neat. Um, you don't really need too many ID cues for razor bills. They're, they're pretty unique, um, but good one is this vertical white line on the bill. And then they've also got a horizontal line from the, from the eye to the base of the bill. Um, otherwise, they've got the same black and white coloration. They've got the white tips on the secondary wing feathers. They do tend to be stockier um, with thicker necks than the MERS. And then they've, the, the bill is just massive relative uh, to the MERS. And we are moving on to pretty much my absolute, one of my absolute favorite uh, Newfoundland birds, and that is the black guillemot. Uh, so this is our smallest breeding auk. Uh, it's known as the sea pigeon in Newfoundland. Uh, you can see why. Um, again, we've got our black and white color palette, but with one notable difference, those bright red feet, which are the reason I love them so much. Um, and they nest on rocky coastlines. Uh, so we've got a black back here and a black breast and belly with a thin, sharp bill, but we have these big white patches on the wings, and then you've got red feet and legs. And you can actually see those red feet and legs underwater, uh, so it's really neat when you see them swimming. Um, Cornell, who, who uh, they have a site all about birds, which you should check out, and uh, they have good descriptions of all of these birds. They have described them as pot-bellied, which seemed a little bit rude to me, but I can kind of see their point. Okay, our next auk is by far the most famous auk. That is the Atlantic Puffin, of course. Uh, this really needs no introduction and it doesn't really need ID cues because there's not much you can mistake it for. It's our most iconic bird um, called the sea parrot and hatchet face here. Um, and as I've said, we're home to the biggest breeding colony of Atlantic puffins in North America. And in fact, half of North America's puffin population is found breeding in Whitless Bay. Um, these guys nest in burrows like the storm petrels, and they also experience the problem of attraction to artificial light. Uh, and hence the puffin patrol that I mentioned by Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. So when pufflings, which is what young puffins are called, emerge from the burrows, they often head towards the coastline instead of out to sea, and they'll land on roads and get hit by cars. So the puffin patrol uh, goes around for a few weeks in late summer and collects those stranded pufflings and returns them to the water. ID cues for puffins, you've got this colorful parrot-like bill. Uh, however, it should be noted that it gets considerably less colorful during the winter. Uh, so during the winter, it actually gets a little bit smaller and some of the colorful sheaths fall off. So it looks a lot grayer and these white, this white face pattern also becomes a lot grayer. So puffins in winter are not quite as colorful. Um, again, you've got the awk coloring. So you've got black upper parts and white under parts, bright orange legs, short straight wings that actually beat incredibly fast. Um, so they can beat 300 to 400 beats per minute because it is hard work to keep a puffin in, in the air. And I think anybody who's ever seen a flying puffin will agree with me that they are just a little bit silly looking. All right, and our final awk, and that is the dove key. And you'll notice that I've got the title in gray here, and that's because we really don't see dove keys when they look like this. So this is the smallest of the alcids, but again, one of the most abundant birds in the North Atlantic. Uh, again, we have that sort of little pot-bellied, uh, bulky um, construction. And uh, Cornell described these guys as flying billiard balls with whirring wings. Uh, so Cornell has some really, really good descriptions of these things. 
Um, again, you see the same color scheme as the other ulcids. So you've got the white and the black. Uh, but if you were to see a dove key in Newfoundland, it would actually look like this. So you've still got white and black, but the color pattern has shifted a little bit. Um, so here you've got black up parts, the white under parts, but you've got this crescent behind the eye here, uh, a very short bill, a short tail, and uh, this sort of no neck appearance, which has been explained as the reason that their Newfoundland nickname is the bull bird. Um, so they breed way up in the Canadian Arctic and they winter down around here. Uh, so you're not going to see them breeding in Newfoundland, but you can see them in the water in the winter. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of the seabirds. Uh, we are now moving on to the gulls and terns. And apparently I put terms in the uh, title instead of terns, which I think is a good example of how when you write something too many times, you stop seeing it. Um, so we're going to talk about five bell species and three turn species. And again, I'm going to add the same disclaimer. Uh, so we're focusing on species that actually breed here, um, not species that just kind of happen by. And for most of the gulls, I'm not going to be focusing on juveniles or immatures, and I'm not going to be focusing on what they look like in the winter. Um, that's, that could be a whole series of its own. And as a matter of fact, uh, Nature NL does have an event that covers exactly that. Um, so they have a winter gull ID session, which I believe they're going to be offering towards the end of February. Um, and I strongly suggest going to that. It's well worth your time and they'll go into much, much more detail than I go into here. So the first gull we're gonna talk about is the black-legged kittiwake. Uh, and the Newfoundland nickname for that is the tickle ace. I'm not sure where that nickname came from. Um, so it is the third species that breeds in really large numbers at Cape St. Mary's. So uh, if you go to Cape St. Mary's in June, you'll see the gannets, you'll see the common murs, and you'll see the kittiwakes. Uh, there are other species that breed there in smaller numbers for sure, but uh, th those are the kind of three main species there. Um, kittiwakes are unlike most gulls, or at least unlike what we think of when we think of gulls. Uh, they're not scavenging food from dumps, uh, but they eat mostly small fish and marine invertebrates. Uh, so ID cues for the kitty wake. Um, you've got a narrow pointed yellow green bill, uh, light gray wings and back. You've got nice black wing tips you can see here. And then believe it or not, the black legged kitty wake does have black legs and feet. And you can just see the gull's foot there. Um, these are pretty small gulls. So, you know, they're, they're going to be perhaps, well, they're smaller than anything else you're going to see breeding here in the summer, any other gull you're going to see breeding here in the summer. Um, and this is the one case where I'm actually gonna make an exception and cover what the immature looks like because they are very, very distinct. Uh, so juvenile and immature black leg kittiwakes um, have this really, obvious black band on the back of their neck. They've got a dark area behind the eye. Unlike the adult, they have a black bill, but they do still have black legs and feet like the adult. And then they've got a black tail tip. And if you see them flying, uh, the black on their wings will actually form the letter M in flight. So that's a really good ID cue for black leg kittiwakes. Our next skull is the black-headed gull. Um, even though in this picture, I agree, his head definitely looks more brown. Um, so these are actually a common old world or Eurasian gull, um, but they're known to winter on the coast of North America. And they're known to breed just on the west coast of Newfoundland. Uh, so in the Stephenville area and small islands off the coast. Uh, so they're not a common breeder by any means in Newfoundland, but they do, they do breed here. Uh, they nest on the ground and they tend to nest with other gulls and terns. And so ID cues for the black-headed gull. Uh, well, first of all, in terms of breeding gulls, it's our only gull with a dark head. Everybody else has a white head, so that does make it easy. Um, you've got this brownish black hood and a red bill, red legs. When you see them flying, you've got this white leading wing edge. So you can see the, the outer feathers there are white, which is a good Clue. And then you've also got this white arc around the eye. Uh, on this one, I suspect this is a slightly younger gull. It's not quite as white, but you can see that arc quite well. 
Okay, moving on in the gulls, the ring-billed gull. Uh, this is our most common, widely seen gull, um, and it's the gull you're most likely to see away from the coast. Uh, so they'll nest happily inland near freshwater. Uh, and these are our classic gulls. They're opportunistic foragers. They will eat fish, but they'll also eat insects, they'll eat rodents, and they'll happily eat garbage. Happily, ring-necked bills, or sorry, ring-billed gulls in breeding season are actually relatively easy to identify because they've got this yellow bill with a dark wing around it. Um, they've also got a pale eye, pale gray back, and then two of the ID cues you can't actually see on this photo. Uh, so they have black wing tips and they have yellow green legs and the color of their legs is kind of important. Um, so the, because uh, it helps to distinguish them from one of our other common gulls, the herring gull. Um, breeding adults have this nice clean white head. Non-breeding adults can have variable amounts of tan streaking on the head. And so here's our, our uh, one of our other super common gulls, the herring gull. Um, and you can see that one of the big differences right here is the color of the legs. So that's something that I've been trying really hard to learn with gull identification. Look at the legs because the legs can tell you a lot. Uh, herring gulls, their populations increased greatly during the last century. Um, first of all, because the species gained legal protection from hunting, uh, which was a major problem for them. But the second reason is that its food source increased. And it won't surprise you to know that its food source is basically, again, garbage, uh, discards from fishing boats, that sort of thing. Um, populations of herring gulls in Newfoundland decreased after the closure of the cod fishery, lack of those fishing discards, uh, in the early 90s, but now populations are stable. And uh, they're, they're quite easy to see around here as well. Uh, so identification cues for herring gulls. Um, we've got a nice clean white head again, pale gray back, black wing tips with white spots, these pink legs, a pale eye, and these guys are considerably bigger than the ring-billed gulls. So they're a large gull and they've got quite, quite a sizable bill there. Now, some of you may have noticed that the one thing that I didn't point out on this guy is this red spot on the bill. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that certainly herring gulls are not the only species of gull that have that black spot or sorry, that red spot, but also I actually wanted to focus a little bit on it. Um, so my training is actually in behavioral ecology. That's what I did my grad work in. And I think the red spot story is super interesting because it actually has a lot to do with the birth of animal behavior as a field of study. Uh, so in the mid 20th century, Nico Tinbergen, who was a Dutch scientist uh, and is known as one of the fathers of animal behavior, he noticed that when gull chicks begged food from their parents, they pecked at the adult's bill to make them regurgitate food. Uh, and if they didn't, they wouldn't get food. So he wondered if that red spot might be kind of important for the chicks. And he did some experiments where he varied the coloration and the shape of an adult's bill. And what he found out is that that red spot is an absolutely essential visual cue. So the, the, gut, the chicks need to be able to see that red spot and peck at it to get their food. Um, and so Tinbergen actually uh, received the Nobel Prize for his research, including that gull research in 1973. Uh, so I think that's kind of a neat story about the red spot. And you can see here, as I said, there are other species of gulls that have that red spot on their bill. Um, this is the last gull we're gonna talk about today. It is uh, the largest gull species in the world, and it has a pretty powerful build. And again, according to Cornell, it has a very domineering attitude, which anybody who has been around great blackback gulls will agree with. Uh, so it feeds mainly on fish and marine invertebrates, but it will scavenge from other sources, uh, and that includes the eggs and chicks of other seabirds. So these gulls will happily take the chicks of other seabirds and their eggs when they can. Um, we have some large breeding colonies in uh, Newfoundland on islands, which includes Whitless Bay and Hare Bay. Um, and so as for field marks for this gull, the name once again gives it away. Uh, so the main thing you're looking at here is this dark wings and back. 
Um, it's our only breeding gull with dark wings and back, although it is not the only gull that you can see during the winter uh, that has this dark, dark coloration. Um, once again, we've got dark wing tips with white spots. Uh, we have pink legs, um, a red ring around the eye, a really heavy bill, and this is just a much bigger gull than the other ones. So stocky gull, thick neck, uh, size wise, when you're looking at a great black back gull, there's no doubt about it. So that takes us through all of our goals. Uh, and again, I will say that I am by no means an expert on gulls. Um, I, when I first started birding, I didn't realize that there was no such thing as a seagull. It took me a while to come to that conclusion. Um, so I would strongly urge people to register for Nature NL's Winter Gull Workshop, which I think they'll be posting soon. Um, and they'll tell you a lot more about the gulls that you can see in Newfoundland in the winter and how their plumage changes over time. And that brings us to the turns. And so, as I said, for the turns, I'm actually going to hand this over to Megan Boucher, uh, who is our turn expert. Uh, so Megan did some field seasons on Country Island, which you can see down here just off the coast of Nova Scotia, uh, which has some uh, actually multiple breeding turn species. Uh, so she's done a lot of work in turn colonies, and she is going to take us through the three turn species that you can find breeding in Newfoundland. Megan, are you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to turn on my video in case my internet drops or whatever, because um, where there's a lot of people here. But uh, we're going to talk about the terns that are on Newfoundland and the terns that breed there. Um, there's three terns that we'll see. And different from gulls, the shape of the terns, they've got long wings and long, thinner bills, and they're smaller. So this one here is our common turn. Um, overall, uh, we've got a few different populations that breed. We've got some that breed down in renews. There's some that breed actually in Conception Bay. Um, yeah, Conception Bay. Uh, we've got some that are down by Trapassi as well. Um, and these guys actually do mixed colonies where they'll breed with other turn species, such as Arctic terns. These guys are fairly small. Um, they're not very... Uh, big birds, uh, but they can be quite aggressive if you're on their colony. Uh, the picture that you saw of me with a bird in the, in the hand, that's actually a turn chick, and it's a common turn chick um, from Country Island from some of the work that I have done in the past. Uh, so for common turns, overall what you're looking at, a turn in general, you're going to see a black cap you're gonna see the gray body and you're gonna see long wings. And generally you'll see a forked tail for all the turns that we're looking at. But for the common turns, you're gonna notice that the bill on it is kind of this orangey red color, but it's got a black tip during breeding season. The other thing you're gonna to see too is if you saw an Arctic turn and a common turn standing side by side, you'll notice the height. The common turns look bigger, look a little taller because they have longer legs than the Arctic turns. But one of the other features here is if you're looking at a turn on its side, the wingtips and like in this picture here, the wingtips and the end of the tail meet up for a common turn. And with common turns, they've got the dark edging and dark wings for those wingtips. When you see the bird in flight, one thing you will notice is that common terns have a dark triangular wedge on top of their wings. And whereas if you see an Arctic in flight, you won't notice that. Arctics have cleaner wings. This one here is, a, is actually a picture of two that are in the process or trying to mate. And when they are mating, they actually stand on one another's backs and then they try to move their tails and try not to fall off. Um, but this is <laughs> one of the pictures from country where this is what's happening is this is part of their breeding and this is part of the mating time. Yes, I have to admit, I did wonder, Megan, if I should make this presentation R-rated based on this photo. <laughs> yeah, this, this photo is a little... <laughs> little racy if you're a turn. It is if you're a turn, yes. <laughs> and this one's our Arctic turn. And so Arctic turns, once again, you're gonna see that black cap on the head 
like the common terns, you're gonna see the overall, if the wings were closed here, you'd see a light gray color on the back. The legs, if you saw it next to a common tern, you'd notice the legs are shorter. And with this one, they have the nice red bill. It's very, very bright red, whereas the common terns normally have that orangey color rather than the red bill. Um, but they don't generally have a black tip. Now, this is gonna change when you get out of breeding season, but for our purposes here, we're not going to go into that complication. Uh, one thing here, if you saw the wings closed, you'd notice with Arctic terns, they have very long tail streamers. And so those tail streamers actually extend beyond the wings when they're folded. And so that's one thing that helps differentiate them from common terns when they're on the ground or on a nest site or things like that. If you saw them up in the air in flight, you'll notice here the underwing of the Arctic tern has a thin dark line. Common terns also have a dark line, but it's thicker. But one thing on the upper side of the wing is you notice it's clean. There is no wedge, there is no dark, there is nothing, it's just gray. So you're gonna get a clean appearance to those wings versus common terns where you'll see a dark wedge. Uh, when you're on a breeding colony, these guys are actually a little nicer to you than the common terns. Um, you'll still get dive bombed by them, uh, but they're pretty, pretty neat. And uh, being around them is, is quite unique. We do have these also breeding. Um, we've got uh, some of them in a mixed colony down in Renews as well. Uh, there was some in, I think, in Trapassi around Daniel's Head with common terns. And we actually have on the West Coast in the Cauteroy Valley area, we've got uh, common terns and Arctic terns that actually nest and breed right along the road by the Cauteroy Provincial Park. If I did get that name right, it's been a while because it's uh, not summer right now, but um, they breed over on that side. So generally you'll even see them if you're driving by that area and you'll see them kind of flush up. Same with St. Vincent's Beach. They actually breed on that side as well. So sometimes you'll get to see them. Uh, and these guys too, when you're watching them, uh, turns tend to fish by kind of plunge diving. So they don't go under completely. They just kind of plop down and head first kind of thing and pop back up and they go after fish and small invertebrates and things like that. Uh, they're pretty, pretty neat to watch. All right, and uh, we have one more turn species for Megan to go through, but I begged her to let me do this part because I cannot talk about Arctic terns without talking about their migration, mm -hmm. um, which I think is just one of the absolute coolest things about them. Um, so they're known for this incredibly long yearly migration where they travel from their breeding grounds in the Arctic all the way down to their wintering grounds in the Antarctic and then all the way back again. So birds that are in North America cover around 40,000 kilometers each year, which is already amazing enough. Um, but what I thought was really just mind blowing is that in 2013, scientists put trackers on Arctic terns in the Netherlands to see where they went. And what they found is that they actually had an even longer migration. Uh, so they followed these terns to staging ground in the North Atlantic where the North American terns also go. But then they went to two staging grounds, one in the Indian Ocean and one in the Southern Ocean that we didn't even know about. Um, so they just, they ended up in these completely uh, surprising random stopover places and then eventually made their way down to Antarctica. Uh, so they traveled across three oceans and used staging areas that we didn't know anything about. And in total, these birds actually traveled an average of 90,000 kilometers during the non-breeding season. So this is the longest bird migration known anywhere, uh, which just is absolutely mind blowing. So when you come across an Arctic tern in the summer in uh, Newfoundland or anywhere else in Canada, give it some respect because it has come an awfully long way to be there. All right, Megan, back to you for our last turn species. Okay. All right, so we talked about um, the common turn and the uh, Arctic turn. Another turn that we do get in Newfoundland is the Caspian turn. And for this guy, he almost looks twice as big as the two other turn species. So you might mistake this guy at quick glance for maybe a gull because of how big it is. 
And with this guy, um, you're kind of looking at areas like Rocky Harbor and Gross Morn. Uh, there's some areas around there that they actually do breed um, on in Newfoundland. And it's kind of neat to look at this guy as, yeah, we still do have overall a white bird with a grayish back and we've got that black cap, but his bill looks a little bit funny. It looks a little chunky. And this is one way to hone in on the fact that it's not a common turn and not uh, an Arctic turn is, you know, you kind of see this bird flying and it's got a big honking bill. It reminds you of a carrot stuck on a snowman kind of thing. Um, so this is kind of cool. It's, that is one feature I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's a carrot bill because that's what it looks like in flight. Um, but one of the things you're gonna notice is if you see this guy standing uh, with his wings closed, you're gonna notice the dark tips on the wings. You'll notice that big carrot bill, but you'll also notice the feet. The legs and feet are dark. They're a black color. Whereas our other turns we saw, we had an orangey color and we also had a reddish color for that. These guys are black and they are a bit chunkier. They are a bigger bird. They're a large and kind of stocky bird. They still have that black forehead and the black cap on their head. But with flight, what you're gonna see is this whole triangular spot here, uh, their wingtips are gonna be dark, are gonna be basically black, but you'll probably just notice it as dark. So that's a key thing to hone in here. And we do actually get these guys down on the Buran Peninsula as well. And you can see them as early as April, late April, kind of moving in and moving through. The Buran isn't as birded as often, but these guys do um, show up down there on some of the beaches and things like that. So, you know, this is something to keep your mind open for. If you're birding down there, if you're exploring down there, you might see these guys. And if you notice a bird that just doesn't look like it has the right size bill and looks really chunky, you might think it's a Caspian tern. Fantastic. Thank you, Megan, for taking us through those. Uh, Megan was the first one to teach me how to tell the difference between common and Arctic terns, uh, which is harder than it might seem when they're in flight all around your head. And uh, I'm still working on it, but I think I get it right more than half of the time now. So I'll take it. Okay, so that is all the species that we wanted to cover tonight. And that brings us pretty much right to 8.30. Um, I just wanted to finish with a couple of resources. Uh, so I'll mention that Nature NL actually has a checklist of the birds of Insular Newfoundland, which uh, I will put in the chat. Um, so it's something you can buy from them for $2 and they don't charge you for postage. Uh, and it tells you what birds you'll find here at what time of year and whether or not they're breeders. So it's a useful thing to have. Um, there's also an online checklist that Jared Clark of Bird the Rock maintains. Um, so it's an unofficial checklist, but it's pretty official, I have to say. Um, the only thing is that checklist contains all of the, the vagrants and rare things that do show up. So it can be a bit overwhelming at first. Um, and then when we were putting this together, I used the Birds of Newfoundland, which is a field guide by Ian Workington and Sandy Newton, and the Sibley Guide to Birds East. So Jenna talked a little bit about um, field guides last week, and they're definitely useful. And with that, I'll just say again that if you wanted to get in touch with us, um, certainly we'll take questions in the chat now or out loud, uh, but you can also get in touch with us um, by emailing us at nlatlas at birdscanada.org. And thank you all for coming in this week. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Catherine for that great presentation um, and to Megan. We're getting, as you probably see, a bunch of thank yous in the chat. And we also had a lot of uh, comments earlier about Newfoundland names for birds. So that was okay. really cool uh, for anyone who didn't know them. Some of them I never heard of as well. Um, I gotta and say I think that we... really threw me when I first moved here. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think most of the questions uh, we managed to answer as we went through. Uh, but oh, any black headed gull or turn to be present in cupids this weekend? Hmm. Uh, Megan, you can jump in here if I'm wrong, but I would think that it's probably too early. Uh, would it not be? So we still have some black headed gulls around, but most of them tend to hang around right now at um, sewage lagoons or anywhere that's open water that does have some 
potential for fishing. Uh, turns right now, it's a little too early for them, but there is um, there has been quite the movement already on uh, black leg kittiwakes moving in. So there's actually larger numbers of those moving in. Um, I don't know if Ed's still on the call here, but he did. Um, he did end up having a big group, uh, I think, just outside of St. John's uh, last week, it was, I believe. Um, so right now, we shouldn't have terns um, showing up, but we do have black-legged kittiwakes. Our black-headed galls right now are not going to have the breeding plumage or that black head um, that you saw that hood. It's going to be in a winter plumage, so it's going to have just a dark spot behind the eye, similar to black-legged kittiwakes. Um, so yeah, it's kind of right now, if you see a bird that has a black head, I'd be wondering what that could be. Um, is there a description? I didn't see the, the message in the chat. I didn't know if there's a description of it. Uh, I don't think so. Was there Jenna? Um, no, it just said any black headed gull or turn that would be present uh, this weekend. So. Uh Hello, this is Ed Hayden. Um, there's five black-headed gulls at Kitty Vitty Lake now. Mm -hmm. Do okay, but uh, as Megan said, they would be in winter plumage, correct? Oh, okay, right, yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's good to know that they're there. Thank you, thank you, Ed. Yeah, so if it's something that has a solid black hood or a black head, if you're seeing something like that right now, that would be something definitely to get a picture of and to report it to like the Newfoundland uh, bird watching page um, or something to kind of get an ID on it. Um, but yeah, right now at Kitty Vitty Lake, there are a group of the black headed gulls, but they are in their non-breeding or their winter plumage. So they don't have that striking hood. And thank you, Ed, that's great that you've, I've also saw your, your post about the uh, kitty wakes, that's amazing. Seems so early for kitty wakes, but that's really cool. Yeah, it is really early. Uh, the, in other years, I've usually in uh, February before I see them, maybe between, you know, uh, the second week of February. Okay, so yeah, that's a, that's a few weeks early. So I yeah. guess a nice reminder that spring is on the way. Yeah, spring or maybe something changed with their wintering grounds. Maybe it's been yeah. milder and they came back. It's hard to say. It um, is, yeah. Don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we have a few other questions in the chat. Uh, Peggy asked if if we have company at Tim's, et cetera, that would be either herring gulls or ring-billed gulls. Uh, that seems like a fairly safe bet. Um, um, I'll just jump in the, in the winter time. There's probably, there's a few other options for gulls, but in the summer, then you're, you're definitely looking at the herring gull, ring bolt gull, or uh, the Greek blackback. Yeah. But right now we've got a few others around. <laughs> that is true. Yes. Which I intentionally steered clear of, but again, go to Nature NL's winter gull workshop and they will tell you all about them. Um, Teresa asked what months are typical breeding months in NL, especially on the West Coast. And Teresa, that is a challenging question to answer. And it's one that we're really interested in, in terms of, uh, you know, running the breeding bird atlas. Um, partly it depends on your species. So owls are getting ready to breed right now. Um, and then a lot of our migrants don't return until May. Um, depending, I think along the West Coast, Jenna, you can answer this better than I can. Uh, the Northern Pen is later than the rest of the island. Is the West Coast any earlier than the rest of the island? Um, maybe a little bit, but I think once things arrive on the island, they're, they're pretty much here around the same time. So things are pretty much set up on territories by the beginning of June. Yeah, so our peak season for the Breeding Bird Atlas is the 7th of June to the 7th of July, and those dates were chosen because most species are have a high level of breeding activity in that month. Um, okay, Sandra also mentioned the black-headed gulls at Kitty Vitty Lake, which is great, and uh, the link for next week's presentation. Jenna, could you put that in the chat? Uh, yeah, I'll get that. Um, okay, we do get I'm Iceland gulls as well in the winter. Week? I think so, yeah. The, yes. Um, and yes, we do get Iceland gulls in the winter, that is correct. 
Okay. And I think I've made it through all of the questions, but if anyone else has anything they want to ask in the chat or out loud, you're more than welcome to do so. Thank you, Jenna, for putting that in there. Nice. Okay. Well, right. I think we'll uh, we'll call it a night then, but thank you again for coming out and we'll hope to see you next week. Uh, the breeding population of puffins at Elliston. Um, I don't actually know that number. Do either, does any, do, any, do any of you know off the top of your head what the uh, number of pairs of puffins at Elliston is? I don't know um, overall. It, it's, it's a smaller number than say Gull Island, for example, but I'm not sure what it is. It, it's a decent size. And accessible again, like Cape St. Mary's, which is why it's, it's a colony that people know well, whereas uh, Gull Island, which is the island in Whitless Bay, right, Jenna? Uh, yes. Right, Megan? Um, yes. That is, that is a little bit harder to get to. That is inaccessible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless, unless you work there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, I do not know the answer to that. Um, I'm currently looking up Newfoundland tourism to see if they'll tell us, but I don't know. Okay. Certainly enough that you can definitely see them. That's, that I'll say. Uh, okay. All right. Well, um, sorry, we can't answer that one, but uh, thank you again all for coming out tonight. And thank you, Megan and Jenna. We'll see you next week. Thanks to you, Catherine. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Jenna. Oh, and Vernon says, hi, Countess 3000 in eBird, which is fantastic. Thank you, Vernon.